in the, uh, in the book of Acts. And I hear a few little things, so it's a good reminder. Check your phones, if you will. Um, you know that happens to me, too. Um, so just, just check your phones and make sure so as, as we go ahead. But we look this morning at Cornelius, the Roman centurion, and um, I've just titled it, Everyone Who Believes Receives. This is chapter 10 of the book of Acts and part of chapter 11 as well. And I've included both parts so that we get the whole picture um, because we're going to be sort of all over the story this morning. And then when we come back the next time, we'll, we'll go through it uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a more particular way. But as we talk about, uh, I'm going to try to make it much more... Uh, contemporary for us, not just like, okay, this happened about 2,000 years ago, but what does this story, uh, this, thing, this event that really happened, what does it say to us? I think it's important that we really pay attention to this one, because if you read through the book of Acts, which is the story of the early church, it's as the church began, there were no denominations, there were no, the first church of whatever, the second church of whatever, um, this was the beginning of the church, and God was establishing His church on the earth. And um, as we look at Acts, this story, which only covers about four days, takes a chapter and a half in the whole book of Acts. So it's pretty important. And if you read through it several times, as I have, one of the things I found was that on one side of the story, the Cornelius part of the story, he, his story is told in this chapter and a half four times. It's the same thing, four times. Wouldn't you think that God would know better than that? Because God's the writer, yeah? He's the author. Wouldn't you think that God wouldn't be so repetitive? But he did it four times. And then the Peter side of the story, who's the other main character, it's repeated three times in this chapter and a half. Now, come on. You know, if they had turned in a paper like that to me when I was teaching English um, all those many years ago, I would have marked in my red ink pen on the side, repetitive, cut, and things like that. But God the Holy Spirit chose to do this. So it's, it's worth taking some extra time and really coming to it, coming to it with fresh eyes this morning and paying attention. Um, what happened and what, what, why is it important and what does God say to us in this story as well? So let's look this morning at um, Acts chapter 10 and 11. If you didn't, I'll gloss over it a little bit quickly. Uh, but we want to, as we come ahead, okay, here we go. There we go. Okay, this is where we finished last week. So those of you who are visiting with us this morning, and we met you in the park last week, last Sunday, right before we rushed out to the park, this is where we ended um, as we were looking, as we were reading Acts. And we ended with Acts chapter 9. And uh, these two verses look a little funny to you, but what we, would say, what we would say is this. Those of us that were here last week will remember that Peter was making his way up the coast and there were two incredible miracles, incredible miracles. And some of you may have been wondering, well, Pastor, why didn't you spend more time talking about it last week? That's because these miracles were representative, representative of other miracles that were taking place. A lot of wonderful things were happening. Um, and in this one, the first one, Aeneas was a man who had been lame for eight years. He was paralyzed for eight years. And Peter, the Holy Spirit, led Peter to him. And, Holy, and Peter said, Aeneas, Jesus heals you with a special way of, of using uh, the, lang the language, which was literally, as I am speaking, Jesus is healing you. That's what it meant. And so... People saw him walking around and they turned to the Lord. The second one, even more incredible, was Tabitha who had died. And then they said, Peter, come, come quickly. This was in the next city, about 11 miles away. And they weren't calling him to come preach a funeral. Okay, I don't think. The Bible doesn't tell us, but surely they weren't getting the big Pastor Peter to come preach a funeral. I think they were thinking, Peter, come and you pray for Pray for Tabitha, and let's see what God will do. There was hope and there was faith. And sure enough, uh, Jesus raised, God raised Tabitha from the dead, and many believed in the Lord. And I wanted to look at these two things, because we see something here that, that I think is important for us as Christians. God touches our lives, and He blesses us, but God always wants to spread His blessing. Did you know that? 
He always, when God gives, when God does something for us, he always wants that blessing to spread to others. And we see it with these two wonderful miracles. Now, I don't know about you, if I had been Aeneas or Tabitha, worse, and dead, um, to be brought back to life or to be raised from a par after being paralyzed for eight years, imagine, imagine if you were paralyzed for eight years, no walking, and in those days, sorry, no wheelchairs, no handicap access, no elevators. Think about, think about that. We, we don't usually think of it that way, right? None of those things. And Jesus healed you. That'd be pretty great, wouldn't it? That'd be pretty wonderful. But here's this wonderful thing that happens, and God makes it spread because other people see what has happened has happened to Aeneas and everybody starts to believe. Look at this wonderful God. Look how great he is. Look how wonderful he is. And so what I want to encourage you to, to do is this. When God blesses you and God does something for you, please don't stay quiet about it. You may say, well, God didn't raise me from my bed of paralysis for eight years. God just helped me in my finances. <laughs> Or maybe I was really depressed and God's Holy Spirit lifted my heart. May I say something to you? There will be people around you that need to hear that testimony from you. There will be people around you who need that same blessing in their lives, the same blessing that God has blessed you with. And when they hear it from you and when they see it in your life, then they too are touched by God and God blesses them. Amen? Amen. So this is where we ended. Peter stays in Joppa, but we're not going to stay in Joppa this morning. We're going to go 30 miles up the road, a little bit further, to a town called Caesarea. And you say, oh, here comes the history lesson. A very brief one, okay? Caesarea was a seacoast town. Philip was living there, Philip the Evangelist. That's where we left him. Remember, it said Philip went up the coast. He went to Sharon and Lydda. And he went to Joppa, and then he went on up to Caesarea. And so Philip is there in Caesarea. Peter is in Joppa, 30, mi uh, 30 miles apart. And in Caesarea, this, this it was a beautiful city. It had been rebuilt by Herod the Great, and it was named Caesarea in honor of Caesar Augustus, okay? And it was the capital the Roman capital of all of Judea. So because of that, some of the kings lived there, and because of that, there was a very large military contingent. There were many soldiers who were stationed there, and then they spread out throughout Palestine, throughout Israel. Um, and so it is not surprising that we meet this Roman man, Cornelius. So let's take a look at this man. And let's find out a little bit about him. So it's not surprising that he's in Caesarea. What is surprising is what we find out about him. So look with me at it. I'm not going to read everything because, you know, um, we, we can see most of this. So let's just look at some of the things. He and his family were devout. So that tells me he's the father. He's the head of the house. He's a Roman centurion. So I was thinking about it in the first service. You know, we often come to the Bible and we... How many of you, you come to the Bible and you get, you put your Bible brain on, right? You put your Bible brain on and you look at the Bible in a special way, you know? But, so, but Cornelius says, Roman, well, give me another modern word for Roman. Come on. If you're Roman, what are you? Mamma mia, what are you? You're Italian, right? You're Italian. So he's Italian, if you want to think of it that way. So take your Bible brain off, okay? He's Italian. Um, so maybe he's really expressive. I don't know. That's a characteristic we sometimes think um, uh, uh, of Italians. Don't know if that's, that's true or not. It's true of some of the Italian friends that I have. Anyhow. And so we meet Corn Cornelius there. He's a Roman officer. Not surprising because there were many troops that were there. He's a centurion. So that means he is head over at least 100 soldiers. And those things are not so surprising. But what is surprising is what we read now. It says that he's devout. Wait a minute. He's Roman. He's Italian. Romans and Italians were not devout 
They weren't, they, that's not a word that would have been described, would have been used to describe them. They worshipped many gods, many gods, and they also always worshipped Caesar as well as a god. But this says that he and his family were devout and God-fearing. So that tells us something a little bit surprising about him. But let's go a little bit further. Now some of you are saying, hmm, am I going to be interested in this? I think so. Stay with me. He gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. Now we're going to go on a little bit further, but we're going to see a few other things. So he's doing good things, isn't he? So he is devout. He is sincere. He does good deeds. He's giving generously to those in need. He prayed to God regularly. So he, we see a lot of good things about him. And one day at about three in the afternoon, he was in his house praying. That's found in another verse. Why is that important? He was in his house about three in the afternoon. Does that matter at all? Yeah, it matters. It matters that it was three o'clock because three o'clock was the Jewish hour of prayer. It was the Jewish hour of giving, uh, of giving offerings and incense in Jerusalem. And so though he is Roman or Italian, um, though he comes from a pagan, a heathen background is what we would say, worshiping many different gods, not worshiping the one true God, which is what the Jews said, which is who the Jews said God was, he is following the beliefs of Judaism. Does that make sense? So, that's, so this is what we see about him. And then he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God. You know, have you noticed this before? I've, I have read this chapter so many times, and it was only like yesterday for the first time that I noticed this word. Distinctly. Distinctly. In other words, he didn't dream it up. He didn't daydream and had a feeling about it. Have you ever second-guessed yourself? Did I see that or did I not? Have, have you ever done that before? I have. The Bible's very clear. He distinctly saw. So it wasn't a figment of his imagination, but an angel appeared to him and he, who came to him. I like that. It's not just appeared. It's like he had feet and he walked, right? Who came to him. Uh, and some other translations say he came to the room. And he said to him, Cornelius, so this angel knows his name. So we're finding out something about this man, which is surprising. Um, he's not what we expected. He's different from what we expected. Let's go a little bit further, and what else do we see? Uh, a little bit later, his servants describe him in this way, and they say that he's upright, God-fearing again, and he has a good reputation with the whole Jewish nation. Why is that important? That's important because, remember, Israel or Palestine was an occupied territory. It was an occupied country. And those that were at the bottom of the ladder were the Jews. Who was at the top of the ladder? Rome was at the top of the ladder. And so here's this man. He represents the occupying force. He represents the occupying power. And here he is. He has a good reputation with those over whom he has power. That tells us something, doesn't it? That tells us this was a good man. This was a good guy. Even those that probably could have been his enemies looked at him and thought well of him. When I read this, and when you read a little bit further, you'll see something else as well. Or, and I think all of us, when you go back and read it on your own, if you haven't yet, you'll see something also. You'll see that, um, you'll see that as he as he is doing these things, it's not just religious. Have you ever met somebody who's really, really religious, um, but, but it's not in their heart? Have you ever met somebody like that? They're just really, really religious. And sometimes, okay, can we be really honest? Do you like being around religious people? No. I don't, do you? Oh, they make me feel bad. <laughs> they make me feel like I'm not good enough. They make me feel judged. They make me all these things. Really, really religious people that follow all the laws and that when it's not, when it's just in their head. But have you ever been around a religious person? It's in their hearts. It's in their hearts. And what we see with Cornelius is here's a religious man. It's in his heart, isn't it? He really, he's doing good things. He really is. He, he doesn't just do good things because that's what it says in, in God's word. It seems as if 
He wants to do good things. He wants to please God. And so we see this man, it's, it's a good, here is a good person. Now, some of you right now are saying, okay, Pastor Jennifer, got the picture. He's good. Can we move on? Yes, we can move on. But it's important that you get that because this is going to be the foundation for everything else that follows. What I want us to see is this is a good guy. He's doing good things. He's a good person. He's very sincere. He's praying. All these things that you and I would say A plus for all of these things. But what happens in the midst of all this? In the midst of all this, an angel appears to him, and it's an angel of God. Now, my question to you is this. Why would an angel appear to such a good person? Honestly, to such, what would you think? Is the angel coming to say, hey, Cornelius, good job, <laughs> right? Well, that's, well, what other reason? Is he doing anything bad? No. Is he, is he doing something secretly on the sly that people don't know about? No. no. He's a good guy. Why else would an angel appear? Here's where we do a little bit of detective work. So let's see. The angel says, your prayers and your charities have come up as a memorial offering before God. Hey, so far so good. But then he gives him a, an assignment, doesn't he? He says, uh, there's somebody in Joppa. His name is Simon. Also, he's called Peter. Uh, send some people to uh, uh, send men to Joppa and call for Simon. Uh, so go get him. And so immediately Cornelius obeys what the angel says and he called his household slaves and a devout soldier. By the way, that tells us something else. This is a man that has influence and he uses his influence for good. Yes? There's a devout soldier. His family is also devout. He has a good reputation. So we see this, but you know what? This still doesn't tell us everything that we need to know. So let's go a little bit further in the story. And what do we see a little bit further in the story? Now, we have the message. They come to meet Peter, and here's what they say. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> okay, we've read that. We've seen that part already. And it says, he was divinely directed by a holy angel to call you to his house and to hear a message from you. Ah, okay. So now we have another piece of the puzzle. The angel has told, has told Cornelius, uh, there's somebody called Simon Peter. He's got a message for you. So there's more, there's more to the story, isn't there? So here's one more piece of the puzzle. Let's go a little bit further. And then we go a little bit further. Here's Cornelius. Peter goes to the house uh, where Cornelius is. Uh, this Italian, this Italian, okay, um, who is a Gentile, he's not a Jew, so that's a big deal, but we'll talk about that the next time we look at this story. And let's see what uh, Cornelius says to Peter, because Peter, at this point, Peter immediately follows, Peter goes to the house 30 miles away, takes maybe a day and a half to get there, and Cornelius get, tells Peter a little bit more. He says, here's what the angel said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your acts of charity have been remembered. Stop right there. Now we find something a little more specific. Cornelius is not just somebody who prays. Cornelius is not just generally saying, Oh God, there's this and there's that. Lord, I worship you. Lord, I whatever. Look with me very carefully at what Cornelius says. Your prayer has been heard. What does that say to you? What does that imply to you very strongly? What does that mean? That means that Cornelius wasn't just praying in general, as we sometimes pray. Cornelius was praying specifically, wasn't he? And it seems that Cornelius was talking to God, which is what prayer is, about something that he needed an answer to or he wanted to hear from God about. It's very clear as we look at this. Your prayer has been heard. What prayer? And and we go a little bit further and he says, we're here to hear everything you have been commanded by the Lord. So Cornelius has heard enough from the angel to know that this man, Peter, I was praying to God. God sent an angel. An angel came to me and said, go get Peter. And Peter's going to come and he's going to give me a message. Here we are. We're ready to hear the message. But that's not all. Let's look at the rest of it. We go all the way. You got to go all the way to Acts chapter 11. In Acts chapter 11, the event has already taken place. In Acts chapter 11, Peter has already left Caesarea. Peter has gone back down to Jerusalem and he's telling everybody about what happened. 
But here we find the details of the story. Here we get to what we wanted to get to when we started looking. What does it say? It says, Peter says, blah, 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 blah. All of this happened, okay? I've included it so you can see. Verse 14. He will speak words to you by which you and all your household will be saved. Bingo! We found the gold, brothers and sisters. This is what we wanted to get to. We went through all, of, all four of those passages to get to this point. This was there. This is what the angel said to Cornelius in the very beginning. You say, but he didn't say that in the very beginning. You've got to read your Bible clearly. You've got to read your Bible carefully. And Peter says, this is what happened. He will speak words to you by which you and all your household will be saved. So there was something in Cornelius' heart. We could, oh, there's so much we could talk about here. But what I want to say is this. Because this story, what I want to say is this. This story answers questions that a lot of us have about God and about Christianity. Is God good? Well, you say, yes, but how do we know? Well, this story tells us. Is God fair? Well, you Christians, you say, yes, but how do you know? This story tells us. But what about people who are good, but they don't follow Jesus? You know, Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, as Penina said this morning as we were singing, right? But what about people that don't follow Jesus? There are a lot of good people that don't follow Jesus. Have you ever thought that? I've thought that before. And a lot of times when I talk with people, that's something that they say. But what about people? What about all of those people that are very sincere? Have you ever talked? Has, has anyone ever said that to you? Or have you ever tried to share Jesus with somebody and their reply to you has been, but I'm a good person? Yeah? <laughs> uh, Maria laughed because that happens a lot, right? That used to happen a lot when I was in China. And um, I would share, I would talk about Jesus. Uh, and I would talk about sin and, and sinner. Because in, in China, when you talk about being a sinner, uh, it's different from English or perhaps other languages. In Chinese, uh, the word actually means criminal. Did you know that? That's what the, the, it's a criminal or whatever. And so, you know, so I'd be talking to my students in university and they would look at me and say, well, I'm not a criminal, <laughs> you know, because that's, and so, but we have, we have these questions. What about people who are good? What about people who are sincere? And now, if that's what you're thinking this morning, I don't want you to be offended and I don't want you to say, well, you, whatever, I, I want us just to look, let's look at this story and let's see. Because if you're thinking this and if you have this question, I want to tell you, this is a question that many of us have, that many people have. And if you want to talk with Jesus about someone, many people will, will say exactly these things. So what I want us to see is this this morning. God, the writer of the, of the Bible, included this story in the Bible to show us this man, Cornelius, who was really good. He was. He was really good. He was really devout. He was really God-fearing. He did good things. He had some truth. Do you know there are a lot of religions that have some truth? A lot of religions. He had all of these things. He was all of these things. He was all of these things. And yet, to such a man, God sent an angel to say, there's more. And you're going to hear a message that will help you and your family be saved. That will help you to have a relationship with me. That's what it means to be saved. It's a, that's a religious word, right? To be saved. And sometimes we think, oh, to be saved, what do you mean? It just means to, to have a relationship with God. To be at peace with God and there's nothing blocking. There's no sin in the way. That's, that's simply what it means. We could be more theological, but that's really, really, it's just that simple. To such a good person, God sends an angel. And God gives a message. And the message is, here's what you need to be saved. There's more. There's more. The verses that we looked at 
showed us that Cornelius was reaching out to God. But I think that he realized there's something more. I think maybe Cornelius, do you, let me ask you, do you think Cornelius prayed to God on his knees? And do you think Cornelius said, God, I'm doing all of these things, but I don't know how to be saved. How should I be saved? Do you think Cornelius prayed that? I don't think Cornelius even knew the word how to be saved. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. But I think what we have read, these verses that he, we've read, show us there's something, there was something in the heart of Cornelius, in the prayer of Cornelius, reaching out to God, right? He was doing all he could do. He was being all he could be. He was giving all he could be, not just out of duty, not just being religious. He was a good person. I tell you what, I would want Cornelius to be, to be my neighbor. In fact, maybe I'd want to marry this man. <laughs> you, <are laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, you know what I mean, right? This is a good guy. It's a good guy. But there was something more. And to such a man, to such a man, God says, here's the message that you need. As I was thinking about this, I shared it in the fir first service. I want to share with you as well. I, I think sometimes we pray, and I think sometimes when we don't yet have a relationship with God, we may pray and we don't even know what to pray or how to pray. Have you ever found that to be true? Maybe some of you are that way at one time as well. Many years ago when I was teaching in China at the university, um, we would share, we would talk about Jesus with our students, and um, we had shared with our students, and at that time I was teaching not university age, but I was teaching the teachers of Beijing University, uh, lecturers and, and others in, in Beijing University. And then my parents came for a visit, and my mom had the opportunity to share with some of the young women in the group. And one of the young women, uh, one of our students, accepted the Lord. Her name was Li. L -I. I see, I don't mind telling you that at all because there are hundreds of millions of Lees in China. So you have no idea who it was. was. But mom shared with this young lady and she believed Jesus, she received Jesus, and she became a, Christ she became a Christian. Notice that I didn't say she joined a church and, or she got religious or whatever. She believed in Jesus. But here's the interesting thing. Um, as, as, I'm think, as we're thinking about Cornelius, because I want to make this contemporary for us this morning as well, because this is not just a story from 2,000 years ago. After she believed in Jesus and accepted Jesus, she told my mom a story. I didn't even know. She had never even told us. But she shared from her own life, and she said, as a small child, small child, she said, I was so unhappy. She said, my life was so sad because her family, and you know in China with the one child policy, she was an only child, of course, right? So there were, uh, there were no cousins, there were no, all of this, and so, and she's only child, and she said, the, my mother and my father fought. They, they had a very poor relationship, and they fought all the time, all the time, so there was strife um, in the family. You can imagine how that affects a young child. Uh, and she said, I was so unhappy. There was nobody she could tell. There was nobody she could ask for help. Um, and she was from a very large city. And she was a very, very small child. And she said at night, when they turned out the lights, and I think that eventually the family, the mother and the father split up. Um, I think maybe, I, and then later on, she herself then went away to school and then went away to university. But it was during this period, and she said, she said, I was so unhappy. And she said, I would go to my window, she said, and I would look out in the dark. She said, and I, I would see this cross. I would see this cross in the, out my window in the darkness. And, and this, at this time in China already, there were government, you know, there were many churches, there were government churches and things like that. And she said, I would see this cross. She knew enough to know what a cross was called. It was a cross but she did not know the name Jesus. She'd never heard the name Jesus. She did not know the cross was the, the, was the, the, the instrument upon which Jesus had been crucified to give her peace and to bring her hope. All she could see was this cross in the darkness. And she said, I would look, she says, every night, and I would see that cross. 
and she said, peace would come over my heart as I looked at this cross. And she said, and then I would pray. And she just kind of, she prayed even to the cross, you know, this, this thing that, could, that she could see or to kind of, she just prayed. She didn't, of course she didn't know that there was a God. She's, she, she's from a communist country. She was taught there is no, there, there is no God. But as a small child, she would see this cross and she would pray and it would bring peace to her heart. And then she grew up and she forgot about it, if you will, and then went on to, to, to secondary school, to university, until she came to that time when she was a lecturer at Beijing University and mother told her about Jesus and how he died upon the cross for her to give her hope and life and peace. And as I think about her, I think about Cornelius, who was doing all he knew to do. He was a good man. God loved him. There were things in his life that God was very pleased with, right? Isn't it? It's very clear. God was pleased with those things. But there was something more. I don't think Cornelius knew to even say, God, how do I get saved? But there's something. There's something more. Maybe a little bit like that student of mine that just looked and saw the cross and just felt peace. My point is this, and there are several points here. You could take any one of them that you want. I listen to, I tell you this story, and I promise you this is a true story. And I promise you this is a true story, too. And these things tell me God's a good God. God's a God of love. If you want to find him, I don't think he's hard to find. I, I, I don't think he's hard to find. He's a good God. And your prayers and your calling out our, I shouldn't say your, I should say our, because I include myself. Sometimes when I talk to God, <laughs> if you could hear me talking to God so inelegantly, I'll sometimes talk to God and I'll just say, oh God, you know what I mean, because <laughs> I don't even know how to say it. I don't even know how to say it. A little bit like Miss Lee, <laughs> praying to a cross and having peace. Perhaps like Cornelius, because we don't know exactly what his prayer was. We can guess from what we read. But what this speaks to me is he's a good God. What this speaks to me is he's a fair God and a loving God. Because you think, here's this, he's a Roman. He's a pagan. He's a heathen, if you will, to use these words that we Christians sometimes use about people that, that don't have a relationship with Jesus. And God heard that. And God in love sent someone so that he could know, so that he could find salvation, so he could find what he was looking for, though he didn't even perhaps really know what he was looking for. And as we look at this, and I, do, do you see that? Do you, as, we, as we look at that this morning, I want, to, I want to encourage you as well, because here are some other things as we look at this. He will speak words to you by which you and all your household will be saved. What I want to say to us this morning, and what I want to remind us of this morning is, our good deeds are not enough to save us. Our sincerity is not enough to save us. Now don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you what God shares in His Word. Because in fact, this is not the bad news. Brothers and sisters, this is the good news. This is the good news. The, the message that the angel brought, it's not bad news, it's good news. Our good deeds, they're good, but they're not enough to save us. They're not, they're not enough to begin a relationship with God. They're not enough to take care of the problem of sin in our lives. Our sincerity, and we're sincere, aren't we? It's not enough to take care of the sin in our lives that keep us from having a friendship and a relationship with Jesus. And a lot of people come to this point and they don't like it. Let me be really honest with you. Maybe we don't like it either because we think, this is too hard. God is too exclusive. Christianity is too narrow. Yeah? They're sincere. What about all of these people that, whatever, and they come to, they come to this point, and Jesus says, I'm the way, and I'm the truth, and I'm the life, 
And rather than looking at it as good news, we look at it as bad news. What do you mean Jesus is the only way? He's the only truth? He's the only life? Because honestly, with our hearts, we look and we think, but what about everybody else that isn't following Jesus and going His way and following His truth and receiving His life? Here in, I think that's in Guangzhou. I, don't, I thought that was in Hong Kong, but I think that one's in, that's in Guangzhou, probably at Chinese New Year time, probably, as we look at that. And what about here? I, I, all, of the devout, all of the devout Hindus, we look at that and we think, why is God so exclusive? May I say something to you this morning? I encourage you to do a little bit of homework because if you, like many of us, have thought, well, God is so exclusive. Christianity is so exclusive. That's why I don't, I, I don't want to, I don't want to go the Christian way. It's too narrow. It's too, you can't, you can't, you can't. I want to tell you this morning, that's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. You do a little bit of homework and you know what you will find out? You will find out even Hinduism for all of its open doors. Oh, everybody, everybody, it's exclusive. You'll find Islam is exclusive. You'll find Buddhism, that's Tibetan Buddhism. It's exclusive. All of these, it's exclusive. It's this, it's this, it's this. Th that's in Hong Kong. A as we look at that, that's in, that's in Tibet. Some of these I saw myself when I was there. And it, you see people who are so sincere and they're so devout. And our response, because I'm sorry, we have heard, I think, the lie from the enemy so much. We, we think, yeah, but what about these people? They are sincere. What about these? They're good, but they're good people. And Jesus says, I'm the way and I'm the truth and the life. And Peter said, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. That's Acts 4.12. May I say something to you this morning? And we're going to look at a few more verses, but I want to say something to you this morning. And, and I feel this strongly, so I'm not angry at you. I'm just feel, I, I, I'm feeling it very strongly. Don't get upset that you feel it's too exclusive that, that there's only one way. Don't get all worked up about, well, there's only one way. Instead, get excited that there is a way. There is a way to God. And God has shown that way in Jesus. He's shown that way in Jesus. It's not bad news. It's good news. It's not bad news. It's good news. It, and if anybody could have been, if anybody could have, could have earned salvation by being sincere, devout, and prayerful, Cornelius could have. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And so God, in love, in love, in love, sends an angel and says, here's the message. Here are the words so that you can be saved. I, I suspect, for those of us sitting here this morning, we've probably heard these words before, haven't we? The words by which we must be saved, but we've kind of, but maybe we've been believing the lie. But there are other ways. Well, what about these other ways? Oh, the exclusivity of, of God. It has to be this way or it's no other way. That's because there's only one way to take care of sin. Our good works can't take care of sin. Our devotion can't take care of sin. My piety and my sincerity, no matter how sincere I am, cannot take care of the sin problem. Only Jesus can. Don't be mad that there's only one way. Oh, be glad that there is a way and God has shown us this way. Peter begins to speak to Cornelius, this man who is so good, this man who has done everything he can do, and he says, now he says, oh, now I realize God does not show favoritism. May I say something to you? Peter was a good guy, but I think he was prejudiced and he was a racist. He was, as all of the Jews were at that time. That's, that's, for, and, and maybe that's too strong, but what I think is what they looked at was, well, this is to, you have to come this way. And God was saying, I'm bigger than that. And it's through Jesus. And Peter says, oh, now I get it. Now I understand. He accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. From every nation. No nation that's too bad. From Iran? Yes. From North Korea? Yes. From every nation. 
Don't get hung up on exclusive, exclusive. We're going to look at some verses that talk about how inclusive God is. Just look. Everyone who believes in him through his name will receive forgiveness of sin. Here's another one. And, and his name will be the hope of what? All the world. Now we're going to go fast here, so put on your seat belts. So, and if you want to, if you want to look. I, and I, what I want to say to you is this. These are only a few of the verses, brothers and sisters. Look at what, what's the next one? Luke 24, 40, 47. There's forgiveness of sins for? All, all who repent. John 1, 12, but to? All. all who believed and accepted him. He gave the right to become children of God. This is why I don't like to say, oh, Christianity is a religion. I, I understand it's a religion because that's how it's classified. But religion is man's attempt to get to God, isn't it? Let's try this way, let's try that way. Judaism, let's, we do this, 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 and this to merit in some way. Religion is man's attempt to get to God. Jesus is God's attempt to get to man. Jesus is God's attempt to get to man. And it's inclusive, it's inclusive. Because there's only one way, God makes it open to all. Romans 10, 4, what does it say? What's that word? All. all. Who believe in him are made right with God not just a few all let's look at some more but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved he Christ died for everyone first Timothy he wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth may I say something to you we Christians sometimes just want nice people people like us good people to be saved. Yeah? Oh, come on. Go ahead and say, yeah, that's kind of true. <laughs> we, we tend to discount at times those who are really, really bad, right? Or our enemies or our whatever. We do. We do. Christ wants everyone to be saved. Do you mean he wanted the Jews who put him to death, who lied about him, who said crucify him? He wanted them to be saved? Yes. He said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. May I say to you, that's a big God. That's a big heart of love, isn't it? That's a big heart of love. Second Peter, he does not want anyone to be destroyed. Oh, I get so tired of people saying, well, if he's a good God, why is he sending people to hell? Right? Have you heard that one before? He says clearly he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone. everyone to repent. Everyone to repent. And finally, most famous verse in the Bible. Most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him, whoever shall not perish but have eternal life but have eternal life. May I say to you, do, does that sort of change the way you're thinking if you've been thinking in a different way? It's so exclusive. It's so narrow. It's so whatever. Oh, he's a big God with a big heart of love for each one of us, including for Cornelius, a representative of the government and the army that nailed Jesus to the cross that nailed Jesus to the cross and when we look at this as I said don't get mad that there's only one way don't get hung up on there's only one way oh brothers and sisters be glad that there is a way and God has revealed him I want to close with one more story this morning, and then I'm going to come back to this. Um, we'll come back to this the next time, because there are still some questions. Some of us have questions still, but, but what about people who have never heard, right? Some of us have that question, don't we? What about they, they've never heard? May I say something to you? The Bible tells us about that. The Bible, the, God talks about those people that we say, but they've never heard. They've never this, they've, they've never that. I want to close with a, a, another story this morning, and then we're going to come, we're going to 
end, and I want to just give us a little bit of time to pray. Because I think maybe this morning some of you would like to respond to this God that maybe you're changing the way you're thinking about him. Maybe a lot of us are changing the way we, we think about him. I was, I, I was thinking about this lady anyhow. Um, most of you know that I grew up in Singapore and that my parents were missionaries in Singapore. And you may have heard me mention this story before. And you may have heard mom or dad tell this story before. Um, but they were in Singapore and they had moved from, some of you know Singapore well, so I'll use the I'll use the uh, I'll use the addresses. Uh, there was a Raymond Avenue in Singapore, and the little church where Mom and Dad. This was before I was born. Um, the little church they had started was there on Raymond a Raymond Avenue, and they had moved from there to uh, to Kim Cat Road, which is a, it's still there, and they had started a church and they had bought a, a big building that had it was very large. Five families had lived in there, and there had been a soy sauce factory. And so they took the big soy sauce vats, you know, to make soy sauce, and they had, they had broken it up to make the, to make the road to come in. And um, they didn't have a sign up or anything like that. And uh, so the church had begun there. So I'm thinking about Cornelius yesterday, and I was talking with mom and dad and, and, and was remembering this. And on Sunday nights, it was more relaxed, and my dad would sometimes ask, how did you become a Christian? How did you come to the church? And the church was bilingual. It was English Cantonese, okay? Uh, so English Cantonese. And this one lady, Fu Sinai, Mrs. Fu, stood up. She was only a Cantonese speaker. And that she had been coming to the church. She'd gotten saved. She really had given her heart to Jesus. And she stood up and she said, she said, this is how, I want to tell you how I came to the church and how I came to Jesus. She said, I was very, very devout. I was very, very sincere. I gave alms often. I went to the temple almost daily. She said, in fact, I didn't just go to the Chinese temple, because in those days, uh, Singapore was uh, so many temples, so many gods, so, so many. Uh, the, the kitchen god, the war god, Gun Yum. Uh, 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 I can't remember all the names. Mom knows all, all the names. And she said, I was so, because I, because I wanted to make sure I didn't miss any god, she said, I even I went to the Hindu temple also. So here she is, she's Chinese, she's Cantonese speaking, but you know, Singapore is very, a very pluralistic society, so there were uh, uh, Chinese religions, Hindu and uh, um, Tamil and Muslim as, 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 as well, a lot of Malays there as well. And so she would go to all of the temples that, that she could, and she said, and I would go to the Hindu temple, and she said, one day, as I stood praying and giving incense and bowing, as you would do at the temple. She, and she said, I was praying. She said, I looked at all of the gods, the representations of all of the gods. And she said, I looked at them. She said, and I prayed, a little bit like Cornelius. I prayed and I said, God, which one of you is the real God? <laughs> Can you, seriously. Seriously, may I, may I say something to you this morning? We look at that as I'm telling you this story, and you already know there's a good outcome. But may I say to you that you and I are kind of in that position as well? We really are. We may not be bowing down to idols and burning incense, but there are a lot of people who would never go to a temple or burn incense who still are looking at all the different ways in the world and choosing this way or that way or another way or making their own way. It's really true. We're, we're very much like Fu Sinai, Mrs. Fu, if you will. She says, and I looked at all those gods and, and I just prayed, God, which one of you is real? If you will show me that you are the true God, I will worship you and follow you the rest of my life and I won't follow any of these other false gods. That was her prayer in the temple as she was burning incense in front of all these gods. She went home. She said that night, she said, I was awakened, not a vision, 
Now, it'd kind of scare me, I think, but, but she had prayed. She said, I was awakened, and she said, there was a man ah. <laughs> standing by my bed, dressed in white. Now, she didn't know enough to say it was an angel. She just knew I was awakened, and this man was standing there. And the man said to me, if you will go to 1A Kimcat Road, there they will tell you about the one true God. 1A Kimcat Road was the address of our church. There was no sign outside. It didn't look like a church because it looked like a big house and a soy sauce factory, but all she had was the address. And she went to 1A Kimcat Road. And there she found the way, the truth, and the life. So we're going to close in prayer now. And I just wanted to share that with you because the story of Acts is still happening. Because God is still the same God. And you know what? People are still the same people, aren't we? We are, aren't we? We're good. We're religious. We're doing the best we can. We're sincere. We're trying our hardest. We pray. Sometimes we don't even know how to pray. We just kind of pray. And God hears. And God cares. And God loves. That's okay. Just keep your focus. It's okay. And God loves. There's some of you right now that I think are ready to say, I believe and I want to receive. Yes, you're right. Some of you may not be that far, but you may be at the place that you're willing to say, God, if you will show me you are the one true God, I'm going to stop all these other roads I've been walking down and I'm going to walk down your road and I'm going to begin a relationship with you. You're going to have my life and you're going to be my God. And this is the way my life is going to be. And so I just, for some of you, you're Christians already, but you've had some of these questions. You have, because I've had, I've had some of these questions too. Next time we'll talk about some of the other questions that are answered in this story, but we got enough to chew on today, don't we? So I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes and what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Some of you may say, what do you mean the Holy Spirit saying to me? What's going on in your heart? What's going on in your thoughts? Talk to God about it right now. And I'm going to pray for you. You can pray for yourself. You talk to God. You don't need to use fancy special language. We're just going to talk to God right now. And I'm going to pray for you. And as I pray for you, I'm going to give you, some of you, I'm going to give you the opportunity, if you're ready, and you realize, God, you're true and you're real. And I've been, I've been upset and angry that you are so exclusive. But instead, I'm going to be happy that there is a way and you have shown me the way. And so we're just going to pray right now. And you can pray, you can use your own words, or you can use the words that I'm using. Lord, we come to you right now. And Father, we want to come to you just as we are. And, and Lord, I, I come for myself first, because God, I know sometimes I can get really religious and I use really special language, and I know that doesn't impress you. you you know who I am. And so, Lord, I come to you this morning for myself, and I come on behalf of the church. Lord, I come on behalf of everyone who is seated here today. And God, as we have looked at this story about Cornelius, I just want to say thank you for including this story in your word, because it, it has helped us to see what you require. It has helped us to see what is good enough and what is not good enough. It helps us to see that you understand our prayers when we don't even understand them. You understand the longing of our hearts when we don't even know what we're longing for. But you do because you made us and you love us. And you are seeking us when we've been seeking every way under the sun. Thank you for including Cornelius in your word. He speaks to us, Lord. And Lord, we wish, a lot of us, that you would just send an angel to us 
but God, you've done something more and you've done something better. And you have let us hear your message this morning directly from your word. And so we stand before you now. And there's some of you, I'm going to lead you right now in a prayer of accepting Jesus. Jesus, I come to you now. You can repeat it after me softly or aloud if you want. Jesus, I come to you. I understand that my good works are not enough. I understand that my sincerity is not enough. I understand that my good deeds are not enough. I understand that you are enough. And this morning, this moment, I believe in you and I receive you. I have many questions, but I know enough to believe in you. Take my sin. Change my life. Be my friend. Be my Lord. Give me new life. In your name I pray. Amen. We're going to pray one more prayer for those of you that still have questions. Lord, I've heard a lot today. <laughs> and it's making me think. And so, God, I'm sincere and I mean it. If you really are the one true God, if you are the way and the only way, would you reveal yourself to me? And when you do, I will follow you. I will give you my life. I will go down your road and not all of these other roads forever. Thank you for listening to me and hearing my prayer. I mean it. I'm sincere about it, God. And I will wait to hear from you. And then I'll respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day in the Lord.